Hello, hello. This is Kim Addis from Frame of Mind Coaching, and I am the host of Resilience Radio, where I interview professionals who are experts at crushing the tough stuff. Before I introduce my guest, I want to give you a journaling question for the day. And once you journal this response, I'd like you to send it to me. So here's your question. What is the behavioral trap that you fall into over and over again? In other words, where do you keep sliding off track? Where do you keep falling into a place where you you say to yourself, how did I get here? What's the thing you keep doing over and over again where you say, why do I keep doing that? And how does it affect you? So journal about that and send it to me, Kim Addis at frameofmindcoaching.com. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to send it to one of my formidable team members at Frame of Mind Coaching, and you'll experience the magic of a coaching call complimentary on us. Today, I want to introduce a very, very special guest. It's someone that I've known for a while. We bumped into each other think uh, at a conference years and years ago. I don't even remember which conference it is, but very special person, very quirky, very funny, very interesting, very, very unique. Her name is Sufit. Sufit, are you here? I am very much here. <laughs> Welcome. Yeah. I'm so happy to have you here today. So, so where did we meet again? Okay, I'm going to tell you exactly how it happened, okay? So here, here's the deal. We were in an airport on our way to Orlando, Florida, and I see this person with this amazing hair that um, I I later found out everybody always wants to touch to see what it feels like, And, um, and I look at her and I think, I bet she's going to the same conference as me, but you know what, even though I'm known for my you know, forthrightness and whatever. I didn't, I didn't talk to her and we go to the conference, we come back and I find out we live like, you know, a few door, a hop, skip and a jump from each other. And we shared a cab on the way back because on the way there, we used the same cab driver. We both know the same guy. He took me first cause I'm an early bird. He came back and he took Kim cause she's not an early bird. And that's how we met. And I even know which conference it was. If you want me to share that. Sure, it was a long it was, time uh, ago. It was Mark Victor Hansen's conference on uh, doing a book, um, and it must have been twelve years ago. So wow! And, uh, and since then, Kim and I have become friends, and we've had, you know, we've been at each other's house for dinner, and the kids have met, and I yeah. you know, met my mom years ago, and uh, yeah, so. Yeah, I remember on that drive home, you actually came over for dinner that night. I came over for dinner that night, the yeah. first time we met, and uh, yeah, it was just it was just uh, really spectacular to meet you. Crazy small world. So let's give some people a little history. You went to school and you became a lawyer. I went to school and I became a lawyer, a litigation lawyer. Um, did that uh, practice for about ten years. Uh, as a civil litigation lawyer and then one day I woke up had that kind of Peggy Lee moment you know the is that all there is moment and decided to leave the law I had had four kids by then four and four years so I kept the kids but I left the law and uh, decided to follow my dream to be a singer an actress a comedian did some stand-up comedy on national tv put out a music cd promoted it and but while promoting all this stuff I learned how to promote stuff. So other people started asking me, can you show me how to do this? And before you know it, I'm uh, a coach. First, I was follow that dream, coaching people to, you know, change careers and be what they wanted to be. And then it became step into the spotlight because once you follow that dream, you still got to make money to feed the kids once a week, you know, so. Okay, so go back. I mean, you just skipped over a huge decision that you made in your life. (laughs) So, and I don't want to skip over it. I kind of want to look at it a little bit more carefully because we have a lot of people who listen who are in a place in their lives where they say, yes, I'm in this place. I don't know how to get out of it. I do need to feed my children. I have a big career. I can't just turn my back on it. I spent years and years and years in school studying for this. You know, this has been my whole life. How did you exactly make the decision to shut that off? Did you consult people? Did you journal about it? Like, how did you get to that place? Like, this is a very important conversation. Okay. 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 You want to go there? I'm going to take you right there. Okay. Here it is. 
I was, so we're in Toronto area. I was working as a lawyer and they have this area downtown. I think they call it the path or something. It stands for something obnoxious, but basically what it means is that you're this little mouse walking in a maze underground. And I was a lawyer carrying a briefcase that weighed more than I do walking the halls. And I remember seeing this sign of a guy saying, Bob, I quit or something. You know, this guy was quitting to leave his hand. And I saw that. And I, thought, I can't quit. I just had four babies. We have a mortgage. The interest rates were 11.75 when we bought our house. Uh, we bought the peak of the market and I couldn't quit. Right. So um, and it's not like I didn't like being a lawyer. I liked being a lawyer, but I, you know, I, I would have a baby drop the baby at home with somebody else to take care of go all the way downtown which is like commuting an hour and a half each way and then make another baby and drop that baby with the caregiver and then go and I did that four times and I thought okay what, what's going on here so in the end you asked me an important question how did I make the decision I didn't make the decision the decision was made for me after I had my fourth kid in just over four years so the oldest was not yet four and a half when her youngest sister was born and there were two sisters in between um, and two weeks after I got back from maternity leave they gave me notice and I think they were afraid that I was going to announce a fifth kid if you know if they if, because basically I had my first kid nine months after I joined the firm now I wasn't pregnant when I joined but soon after became and I was their first pregnant lawyer uh, after right. that another lawyer became pregnant and they were not too thrilled with me to introduce that uh, into their world Okay, so, so they gave, they, yeah. let, they let you they, go and you said... They gave me notice. I, I worked about eight months notice, so it wasn't like abrupt. And during that time, I thought, okay, let me, you know, find another lawyer position. But my heart wasn't really in it. And I started dreaming of what else could I do. And uh, so how did I do it? I took myself... I remember there was a Greek restaurant where they had an outdoor patio. And it was really beautiful. And it was also a pizza place. And I would go there. And yes, I did. I, I don't know if it was exactly journaling, but I would make lists of you know what was my ideal life and I think somewhere I still have this list of 10 things that I want and I didn't know exactly what it would be I didn't know that I would become a coach and the word wasn't even really so popular then um, but I did know that I wanted to work with other people I did have this vision of myself sitting across from another person and you know advising and whatever um, and uh, a few years later it just happened you know I I, 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 I somehow um, started coaching uh, the photographer who had taken pictures for my music CD promo and uh, then I um, I learned about the Chamber of Commerce and Board of Trade networking meetings where you could go and I would do the 30 seconds to try to attract more coaching clients and people would come to me and say can you show me how to do that 30 seconds so before you know it I end up having a program on how to do the 30 seconds because I would get clients whereas other people had been going for years and saying you know hi I'm a real estate agent now's a really good time to buy or sell a house because mortgage rates are low and they wouldn't get clients they'd go five six years I'd go once and have a lineup so okay we're gonna uh, get to that in a minute so go back so you said okay I'm gonna I'm going to play around here. I'm not going to go back to law. I'm going to take care of my kids, but I'm going to grow this new career. I'm interested in acting. I'm interested in speaking. Like, is that because you were a good speaker as a lawyer? Like, how no, How did no. you go from that idea to this idea? Okay, so that's a great question. No, I didn't go from it because of, because of being a lawyer. Um, what It was because of music. So I've been a singer and an actress my whole life. Um, you know, when I was five years old, I'd be singing for the neighborhood kids on a friend's deck. Um, I was in the folk club at school. I was in the local productions, um, uh, you know, community theater. And I would sing with other people. When I was, I think, uh, in, in high school, I put on a show with another singer. And I called the local newspaper and they did an article about us. So it really started from music and then I would go here in Toronto, I'd go to comedy clubs um, with a few comedic songs and do a little comedic intro, comedic outro. So it started with, um, uh, you know, being a, uh, liking to sing, right? And then the singing slowly, and, and I'd always been an actress kind of on the side and I tried to do it more professionally. So there was a transition period between being a lawyer and becoming a coach, there was a transition period of about six or seven years where I tried to just be an actress and a singer. 
So I put out a music CD. Um, I was in an East Side Mario's commercial. I was in a commercial in the European cinema. I was a, a regular for four years on a sitcom in Canada, a national TV sitcom. Um, and so it, it really started with that transition because I'd already been doing it. And that was kind of my life's dream to be a singer and an actress. The comedian never really occurred to me. It's just that I would always get the comedic roles. And I thought, oh, OK, I'm funny. OK, I didn't know that. <laughs> so you didn't know you were funny? Well, OK, I knew people laugh when I talk, but it, I didn't know that people would pay me to be funny. OK, so 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 you decided to go down that path. You even did stand up comedy in, I guess, clubs. Yeah, I mean, that was never like a full-time profession. It really, you know, started with the comedic songs and then I did a comedic introduction, a comedic, you know, and then I got a comedic role in this TV show. I was Ludmila Kropotnik, which was this comedically evil cafeteria lady. Uh, and um, so, yeah, I, I, uh, I came to that naturally. And then so when I did those 30-second things that I told you about, naturally I made them funny, you know, because I know that, that humor gets attention. And so, more, yeah. So tell us about the 30 second. It's you know, they call it an elevator pitch. Some people are very anti elevator pitch. So I don't know what you call it, but what is your approach? What is well, your you know, style? Some people also call it the 30 second networking infomercial. The reason I don't use elevator pitch is because elevator pitch, you're, if you're in an elevator, you're usually with one person and it's very, very different to do it for one person or to do it for a whole room. And so when I teach it, I generally focus on doing it for a whole room because if you try to do that 30 seconds that you do for a whole room in front of one person, and I've seen this done, I've, be, I've met people at the, uh, you know, at the buffet table and they're, they're, you ask them what they do and they give you this 30 second canned pitch and it sounds robotic and like an automaton and like they're not really talking to you. So, um, uh, but the 30 seconds, it's basically like a 30 second show. You've got 100 people in the room at the Chamber of Commerce. You've got 30 seconds to introduce yourself. So why be boring? You know, um, so how do you make it funny? How do you make it entertaining? Not well, all of us are funny. Well, you know what? It doesn't have to be funny, funny, but it has to stand out. So, for example, let's say you're not funny. OK, so. Okay. I'm at a networking event and you know how everybody, most of your listeners are probably, if you're in business, you've probably been to one, right? So what they do is they, everybody's sitting down and then it's your turn to talk. So you stand up and for 30 seconds you say, hi, I'm, you know, Bormisa Morrison and um, I, you know, I'm a financial advisor. So for all your financial needs, whatever, right? And then the next person says, hi, I'm a Reiki master. So I can heal you from, you know, 60,000 feet above the earth or whatever and and they're all saying whatever they're saying and nobody's listening because they're all thinking about what they're going to say right so they right. get to me and i'm just silent for five seconds right and then oh my god i've disrupted the whole room because they're used to the next and that and because you only get 30 seconds nobody's going to waste five seconds right so i'm right. silent for five seconds so what happens everybody stares at me Right. So they weren't paying attention to the you know, Reiki master and the financial advisor, but they're sure as heck paying attention to me. Right. And then yeah. I start to talk. And if I really want to shake them up, I stay seated. Why? Because everybody else stood up. Mm -hmm. So I stay seated and I and I talk for 10 seconds seated. Right. And then people are really, really, really stressed out and anxious because that's not what you're supposed to do, right? So they're really paying attention because I've created conflict. You know, if you see a good movie or a good TV show, they create conflict, right? That's, that's the whole point. So they create a, a dissonance. So 10 seconds, I, I say a few things. And then I stand up in the middle of my 30 seconds and I say whatever I'm going to say. And almost all of a sudden, I've created an event. My standing up is an event, a dramatic event because of the tension that I've now resolved by standing up. So let's say you're not fu I mean, funny. I could, you know, I, I've got a whole CD about, you know, how to be funny and a whole a program about that. But, but um, fun being funny is not just jokes. Being funny is about creating a situation where there's some kind of uh, uh, an empathy uh, between you and the listener, like the, Jerry Seinfeld, when he had his show years ago, it, it, there was nothing really that funny about it. It was that they were situations that we all recognize, like going to a, a, a Chinese restaurant and having to wait for half an hour in the lobby. The whole show was half an hour waiting in the lobby, or he goes to an airport to pick up the car that he reserved 
And the whole show is about how they don't have his car. And they go, and he says, well, isn't kind of the point of that, that I made a reservation? That's why they call it a reservation. So we've all been through it. So I'll give you an example. When I was singing somewhere, I wrote a song called Broccoli's on Sale at Dominion which was kind of a love song to my Jewish mother. Kim, you've met my mother. Mm -hmm. May she rest in peace. Uh, I brought her to one of your parties. And um, so she would call me and give me, you know, long distance telephone advice. Broccoli's on sale at Dominion. Don't buy dishes. I've got, let's all bring you. Don't drink Coca-Cola. The caffeine makes you nervous, whatever. So I'm, I'm singing this at a, at a festival and my Chinese, my Asian bass player would interrupt me and say to the audience, and he got a bigger laugh than me, he'd say, when I told the audience about my Jewish mother, he'd say, Sufi, tell me about it, right? Because he has a right. Chinese mother who is also a Jewish mother. Italians, you know, make some of the best Jewish mothers. Hey, me, go by and I'll finish your spaghetti. That's a right. Jewish mother. Yeah. <laughs> so people identify and they laugh. So it's not like you have to tell jokes. You know, there was, there was a movie in the 80s about... Um, Sally Field played the, played this housewife who wanted to, uh, you know, be in a comedy club. And Tom Ham Hanks played a comedian who sold her like 25 jokes. She paid like 500 bucks and she goes on stage with these 25 jokes and they bomb. They don't work. And uh, he tells her it's because they're not you. They're not your life. Just stand there and talk to the people. So I would say to your listeners, if you think you're not funny, it's because maybe you're not being vulnerable enough and open enough with your audience. Because the minute you open up and start being honest, and I'm not talking about dumping your dirty lawn or, you know, whatever, but just to come from a place of authenticity and tell your stories, I think the humor will come out. So are you saying, like, I mean, I actually just watched this video yesterday from Lisa Nichols, and her recommendation is start with the results. Like, say, so, you know, the results of my coaching is going to be X, Y, and Z. So don't tell them how you do it. Don't talk about process. Just talk about results. And like, okay, I was watching it, and I understand. What, what's your advice? Is it talk about results, or is it you know something what? totally different? You know what's interesting? I've 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 seen I've watched Lisa work actually several times from a proximity of about a foot or two away, and uh, between us, it's funny because when I'm in the audience, she knows that I'm there, and she treats me differently than everyone else. And it's so interesting. I don't know if I should be saying this publicly, but uh, whatever. Your people tuned in for interesting. They're going to get interesting. Lisa's audience has drunk the Kool Aid. Okay, right. and she sees that, her. I, and and she knows that I haven't. I, I don't. She. I don't know how she knows. It's not like I ever said anything to her, but she just sees it in my eyes, or she. I don't know. She knows I haven't drunk the Kool Aid, and so I don't get the same shtick that like she doesn't give me what she gives other people. It's interesting, but just to answer your question, um, I mean Lisa you know, great. And she's gotten great results for herself. Um, and yes, I mean, people are interested in results more than process. That's for sure. Right. They don't want to know the program. They want to know that they're going to get noticed. Right. But that said, you, the people who tell you start with the results and list what you're going to do for them, that's like maybe going from, um, an F or a D to a C, you know, or a C plus. But if you really want to go to an A or an A plus, you've got to take the show them what you'll do for them, which is just the C plus, and not just, you know, enumerate it, not just list it. You have to embed it in a story, right? You have to, um, because people, you know, stories, humor, drama, all these devices get people to listen. So I'll give you an example if you want. Um, I was on my way to a networking event or a speaking event. I don't remember. It was many years ago. And my third daughter, Riviera, just came home and told me that she won this public speaking contest in her school. And I said, that's great. And it took me about 10 seconds or 15 to find all my kids and ask them all permission to write this infomercial. I don't remember it verbatim. Um, it's somewhere in my book. I should find it. But um, anyway, the infomercial was about... Uh, you know, four years ago, my youngest daughter, Aviva, won the public speaking contest in her school. Three years ago, my, uh, oh, here, I found it. Um, three years ago, my oldest daughter, Daniela, won the public speaking contest in her school. Two years ago, my second daughter, Paloma, won the speaking contest in her school. And yesterday, my last remaining daughter, Riviera, the shy one, won the public speaking contest in her school. I'm Sufit of Step Into the Spotlight. I'm a public speaking coach. 
Now, far be it from me to exploit my daughter's accomplishments for my own personal gain, but I think the facts speak for themselves, Sufi, for when you're ready to get noticed. Okay, so that's not like a hysterically funny one. That's a factual one where the story is absolutely true. And I did feel a bit guilty about the insinuation, you know, because my kids obviously deserve 100% of the uh, kudos for their accomplishments. But it does make a, a, a compelling and true uh, story. So anybody can come up with this stuff, you know. And, and if you can't come up and with can it, can you do that in 30 make it up. seconds? Can oh, you do yeah. it in 30 seconds? Yes, I can. Yes, I can. And some, some of my 30-second infomercials are more like 46 seconds. But if you're funny, they don't notice. And some of them are 17 seconds. Um, and by the way, if you don't have a true story, nothing wrong with making it up. Mm. Um, and I know you won't hear this anywhere. Um, as long as you admit that at the end that you made it up. And I do that all the time. Like, I'll sit there. I have one infomercial where I would spout out these statistics. Like, you know, 67% of entrepreneurs this and, you know, 37% and 17% and, you know, talking about the subject that I was promoting that day, right? Um, and then in the end, you know, I, I admitted that I made up all the um, statistics, but I admitted it in a funny way. I got a client from that and right. she walked up to me and she said, oh, I'm in the 17% and she knew I made it up. Uh -huh. But the point was that I got them listening. Right. Or another one that I made up, I, I walked in once and I said, um, this was when I was focused on public speaking. I mean, now I focus more on, you know, branding and marketing and just any aspect of stepping into the spotlight. But at that time, um, I walked in and said um, to a group of 100 people, I have just been named North America's public speaking coach and everybody in the audience applauded. Right. Mm -hmm. And then I said something like, now I admit the panel of judges was a little teeny weeny bit small, just me and my mom, right? So then they all start laughing, right? Mm -hmm. And then I said, well, actually, it was just me. And my mom doesn't really think that I'm that funny. And and again, I get a laugh, right? And then I go on and say whatever I'm really going to honestly say, right? Right. Um, it got but attention. Branded, but you branded yourself already. They've already made the association. They've already made the association, yeah. Right. And you okay, know what's so funny? Because that I'll just say one last thing. That was actually a spoof of a real guy who called himself America's sales coach. And I started thinking to myself, well, who called him that? So I made right. up mine about the, where I was called something. And he was seriously calling. He wasn't joking. He seriously calls himself that. He might have even trademarked himself. He's a, gr a great guy, a really nice guy, actually. Interesting. Okay, so if there are people who are listening who say, you know what, I want to get a little bit more exposure. I want to get in the newspaper. I want to be interviewed on the radio. I want to be on TV. I want to step into the spotlight. What's your, you know, three-step advice for them? It could be four, but you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay, I don't do from numbers, but I'll give you something and then you can count. I mean, what am I, an accountant? Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> a uh, I, didn't know, I, I didn't know there was going to be a quiz. Okay. So, I mean, the, the first thing you got to do is find your angle, right? Okay. Uh, yeah. There's got to there's be an angle. There's got to be a story because the fact that, you know, you just opened ABC accounting is not of interest to anybody. But if you were, you know, the banker in Monopoly when you were a kid, and, you know, now you're helping people organize their money. Okay, maybe that's a little bit more interesting. And, you know, it's actually, um, you know, I list about 25 hooks that people traditionally use. There, there could be a, a hook with something that's going on in the news. Okay, so let's say the current president of the United States, I won't name him because um, you want your uh, podcast to be evergreen, uh, probably. But um, let's just say... Uh, he's in the news a lot and he knows how to uh, manipulate the media better than anybody else. And so if people say that he speaks at a grade three level, let's say, then and you're a speech, you know, you write speeches or you analyze speeches or you're a speech uh, expert right. or whatever it is, then you can hook into that. Uh, if there's some kind of a controversy, if there's some kind of an event, a traumatic event that happened, and you coach people around the trauma. Uh, there could be a seasonal hook. There could be a celebrity hook, you know, around the film festival time in Toronto. There are a lot of articles about people who uh, run into celebrities. It could be um, something like oldest child, leader or bully, you know, if you're some kind of psychotherapist. Or are short children really dumber, you know? Or let's say you're a right. nutritionist. Are carrots really killing us? I mean, you got to write some little 
you know, right. press release or, or uh, why are most attention. CEOs? Yeah. Why are most CEOs six feet tall? You know, does your short kid stand a chance? You know, you could be an HR professional or a psychologist. Or, right. You know. Okay. So, so the hook is very important. And once you have the hook that attracts. So I, I'm going to switch gears because there's something that you've done recently that has been very interesting to me personally. So I belong to a whole bunch of LinkedIn groups. And I, I think on Sundays, I get a whole bunch of emails that talks about the updates of every group. And I delete all of them except step into the spotlight. That's the only one I read. It's the only one I pay attention to. It's the only one I tune into. And you have created that group. There's a lot of interaction on that group. It's actually yeah. incredible. And there's a lot of valuable interaction in that group. So, so how did you create it? How did you discover how to make it relevant and valuable for the participants? How did you choose your audience? Like, how did you make this group happen? You know, it, it's very interesting. Thank you for that. Um, I, I'm glad to hear that, Kim. And uh, I've been asked this question a lot, actually. Even Huffington Post Business uh, wrote about us. And I think the reason is, okay, first of all, how I started the group. I was sitting around on January 1st, about five and a half years ago, thinking, okay, what am I doing here? I got to do something different this year. And just on a whim, I started this group. I never took LinkedIn very seriously because it's, you know, way too professional for me. And I'm not, you know, I mean, if you see my promo shot, it's me by a lake like I'm not I'm not uh, into this whole professional itis thing but I had a client who was really into it so I always have to be one step ahead of my clients I said okay if I'm going to be her coach I got to know what I'm talking about right so I delved into it and then um, I after I started the group I thought okay if I'm going to do this it's not going to be boring I mean the author of a book called step into the spotlight a guide to getting noticed if I don't get noticed then I have no credibility in my field as a coach and as an author so it had to be noticed so how did I do it I went about thinking okay how do I populate this group and I basically had two choices there are two kinds of LinkedIn groups there's the kind that I started which I'll describe in a minute and there's the fish in a pond you know the salmon ponds that you go to where you pay some money and they've stocked it with salmon and you fish in their artificially made pond and you pay for each one that you fish out. Um, that's the artificial version that a lot of coaches do. They fill their, um, their LinkedIn group with prospects and then they just fish from that group, right? I decided, you know what, I was going to do a different model. When I first came to Toronto from a small town years ago, I was really shocked that Sam the Record Man was right next door to ANA Records, that Burger King was right next door to McDonald's. I thought, because in my small town, they were in different parts of town. In, in the big city, they were competing with each other right next to each other. So I thought, you know what, let me do that. Let me invite my competitors to join this group. And I don't really believe that I have any competitors. They're just people who do similar stuff to what I do. So I invited the biggest names in marketing, in speaking, in publicity, in branding, all the things that I teach about, that I write about, that I coach about, that are covered in my book and my programs. I invited bigger names than me to join the group because I wanted to, to be a destination place for great people, right? I wanted not them to just come learn from Sufi, the big guru, right? Because I'm, you know, I'm just like everybody else. I wanted them to come from learn from each other. And I made it like a back room, like a kind of green room where the big gurus who position themselves in public as big gurus could show themselves in their underwear to each other and ask the real question. So let's say, Kim, you're a big guru about journaling. Um, and you've got this huge following and you've got your podcast, whatever, but let's say you don't know anything about starting an affiliate program. So you could come to my group and post a question, how do I start an affiliate program or what percentage should I pay affiliates or whatever? And somebody who's a big guru about affiliates would answer you. So that's one of the ways I did it. I decided to populate it, number one, with my you know, colleagues, I won't call them competitors, and also with entrepreneurs who want to learn from them. So I guess you could call, some people would call them the herd, the fish. I don't see people that way. Um, but um, so you have both experts and entrepreneurs who want to learn from the experts. That's one thing. Secondly, who did I invite? I invited big mouths. Okay. I don't want lurkers, although we have many. I wanted big mouths. 
And I, all, you know, people like me and you and people who have an opinion about things and aren't afraid to give their opinion. And how did I find them? I found them by joining other groups. So I'm a member of 100 groups. That's the limit. When it was 50, I was a member of 50. For a short time, I was a member of 105. I don't know how I pulled that off because the limit is 100, but that's just my personality. And somehow they let me do it. So um, I invited people, not just who are big mouths in terms of posting, because nobody wants to hear pontificating and broadcasting. But people who are big mouths in terms of commenting and giving their opinions. So we've got a guy in there who used to hang out with Napoleon Hill, who wrote Think and Grow Rich. We've got mm-hmm. people in there who, you know, are Emmy Award winners, who are, who are, you know, journalists for Inc. and for Entrepreneur, influencers. And the other thing is I didn't allow them to post articles or links. I make them ask questions. So the only thing you're allowed to post in my group is a short interactive question. And that's mm-hmm. how it works. But how did you get so many members? I, inv- I I personally invite them. I mean, I don't invite everybody. I mean, for example, a lot of my members are uh, heads and owners of other LinkedIn groups. For example, there's a guy in there who has a LinkedIn group of 150,000 people. There's another one who has a LinkedIn group of 74,000 people. And because they love our group, they promote our group to their group. So the guy with 74,000 people actually posted something in his group and said, you have to join Sufit's group. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, that's another way that we attract people. Interesting. Um, yeah. Now, do you, do you generate leads from your LinkedIn group? Like, is this a, a, a worthy activity? Yes. Other than joining your group, of course. Yes. Yes. And not only I do, um, you know, if only I did, then it would be like that salmon fishing one that I described earlier. Um, but there are many, many people who have posted even publicly in our group that they have got not just leads, but clients from being an active member of our Step Into the Spotlight group. There are people who've posted publicly that they found their coach in our group. Um, There are people who have been, I mean, I have had countless media opportunities, podcasts, radio shows, um, uh, print articles, uh, TV. Sometimes I turn down because I don't, who feels like getting up early and putting on makeup, but, um, but tons of, of uh, that and yes, clients um, from, from the group, but more importantly, not, not that I've got them, but members have got them. Okay. So let me ask you one, uh, one more question before we round the corner. If someone was to work with you as a client, how do you work with them? Like what is your coaching approach or process? Okay. Well, when I started, it was one-on-one you know, like most coaches do. Uh, Now one-on-one is only available as a VIP upgrade and you've got to be accepted. And usually that's only after you take one of my programs. So I have three programs. One is called Spotlight 101, which is at spotlight101.com, which is a 10-week program that takes you through, you know, kind of figuring out what your story is, what your angle is, how are you going to generate publicity, what to say when you only have 30 seconds, should you write some kind of a book or manifesto, uh, often the answer to that is yes, if you have anything to say about anything. Um, and so I take people through that 10 week process. And then after I did that program, people said, okay, can you dive deeper into the 30 seconds? So I created a, a four week program at 30 seconds.biz where we delve very deeply into the humor and the drama and what do you say when you only have 30 seconds. And the other, the last one is after my book came out, um, People said, how'd you get all those high profile endorsements? Because we had some, you know, many New York Times bestselling authors endorse the book. Um, uh, So I created the book creation workshop for people who want to write books and not just write the book because anybody can write a book, but want to write a spotlight book, one that's going to get them noticed and into the spotlight. So that's how I work with people now. Generally, they come through, first they read my book, which they can see at spotlightbook.com. Then they come into one of those three programs. Usually I want them in the foundational, you know, spotlight101.com program. And then if they're ready and if I'm willing to take them on, we bump them up to VIP where once a month for 90 minutes, um, I guide them to, um, you know, figure out how all of this applies to them. And, you know, a lot of people think you have to really know somebody for a long time and build the know, like, and trust factor. That's what everybody's saying. Somebody said that to me on a podcast yesterday, and I said, yeah, ain't necessarily always true um, before they'll become your clients. I One of my clients is a Pulitzer Prize winning photojournalist. I met her for about seven seconds in a hallway at a conference in Dallas. 
Mm. And, you know, she worked with me and then she came back. And so sometimes if people need, you know, for a project, they want six at once or 12 at once, then I sell them a bundle of VIPs all at once. But that's basically what I do. And the process is I help people find their color, their flavor, their story, and then figure out how to get it out there into the world and step into the spotlight. Okay, amazing. Um, and it's stepintothespotlight.com? Stepintothespotlight.com is, is the blog. And if you want some free tips on how to stand out in 30 seconds, go to Spotlight Secrets. That's with an S at the end, dot com. If you want to read the book and why wouldn't you, <laughs> go to spotlightbook.com. And if you want to join the group that Kim's in, uh, go to spotlightgroup.biz, B-I-Z. And by the way, I want to point out something I just did there. A lot of people, when they're on the radio, they'll say, go to followthatdream.ca forward slash book, forward slash blog, forward slash I don't you remember what you just said, right? No, go to GoDaddy or whatever your place is, you know, for 10 bucks, get a URL that people can remember, like spotlightgroup.biz, like spotlightbook.com, like spotlightsecrets.com. Get a quick, easy URL that you can say when you're being interviewed on prestigious podcasts like Resilience Radio, and um, and that way you can just spout them out without uh, people having to write them down. Okay. All right. As we're rounding the corner to this interview, I have one last question for you. And you have a coach on the line, not a spotlight coach, but a frame of mind coach. Is there a question that you have for this coach? Well, you know, that's a really great question. Um, and despite the fact that you are a frame of mind coach, and despite the fact that I think frame of mind is one of the most important things, uh, I mean, you can't do anything that I've discussed today if you don't have what I call a spotlight state of mind, right? right. So despite the fact that I have... Um, a frame of mind coach on the line, my go-to whenever I meet another coach, especially one as successful as you, who's really made a name for herself in the marketplace, my questions are always the backstage questions, the green room questions. Um, so in your case, I would ask you, Kim, do you find that doing a podcast attracts clients or opportunities to your business? Exactly like you asked me about my group. That's what I would ask you because I had considered doing a podcast for a while. Um, that's the question I would ask you. I'll tell you, you know, uh, I started out podcasting by being a guest and I think I've been on well over, I don't know, 200, 250 shows. I was on one this morning as a guest. And what I found on those shows is that I was saying the same thing over and over again. A lot of the times, like maybe 98% of the times I was telling the same story over and over again. And I also found that the host wasn't asking interesting questions. In other words, they had a set of questions set out and they'd go through their questions. It didn't matter what my answer would be, but they'd go through a set of questions and they wouldn't go down any interesting path. So for me, I'm like, man, I think I could do a better job because I'm interested, you know? So as I'm talking to you, I've been observing you for a while. There are things I'm interested in, right? Like, so if, if I'm interested in being in the spotlight, what do I need to do to change? What, what can I apply from you? You know, I'm watching you from a distance involved in this LinkedIn group, and it's absolutely phenomenal, the level of interaction. So how do you do that? I want to know. So as a host, you know, first and foremost, I want information. I want to know. I want to learn from my guests. The second part is, who do I want to talk to? So the podcast gives me an opportunity to talk to some really interesting people that I wouldn't normally have access to. The third thing is that obviously it gives me content. And so the podcast gives me a very interesting opportunity to have a voice, but also pursue my passion, pursue my interest. And when I ask this particular question, and usually it's more of a frame of mind kind of question, I give, I have the opportunity to say, hey, here's what coaching might feel like. Here's what it would look like. Here's what it would sound like you know, yes, maybe we haven't had a conversation yet, but here's an introduction to me. And I have to tell you how often uh, it's happened as a guest on podcasts and as a host on podcasts, you get to know the other person on the other end of the, uh, you know, either the, the, the person hosting the podcast or the guest, and suddenly they're interested in coaching or suddenly they know somebody who should have coach coaching or suddenly their uh, network hears them as the guest and 
you know, it leads to other things. So absolutely podcasting is a very interesting way to get your voice out. And I'm surprised you don't have a podcast, to be honest. Yeah, no, I, I you know, I, I was considering it. And it's interesting because I'm such a natural inter- I mean, I, you know, I have had the pleasure of, of interviewing Dan Kennedy and Jay Conrad Levinson before he passed away. And Al Reese, like people, big, big names in the marketing field, which I made into CDs, but I never thought of doing it regularly until recently. Um, but I'm just not sure like you, I, I'm a guest, you know, I've done, I don't know, three, four this week so far. I wonder if it's more fun and less commitment, um, to just continue being a guest. You know, I do many podcasts every week, every month. Um, you're right, Kim, a lot of people ask the same questions and I'm always appreciative when they don't ask the same questions. I'm always appreciative when they don't ask me to send them a list of questions. Of course, I have a list of questions, which, you know, if people ask me, I'll send them. But I always make a note, please feel free to deviate from the questions. And I love that. And, you know, it's interesting. Before we started today, Kim, we got on the line a little earlier with your producer. and We did a sound check and we met, you know, 15 minutes before you know, you were scheduled to come on. So we did our sound check in one minute and your producer said, um, okay, I'll, I'll come back in about, you know, 13 minutes before Kim comes. And I said, no, no, tell me about you. And I spent the next 12 minutes interviewing your producer. So, and, and it wasn't on the air and it wasn't recorded, but obviously I have a natural interest in uh, interviewing people too. Anyway, congratulations on your podcast. It's awesome. And, um, it, you and do, you, I, you know what? Job. You know what's you know what's super interesting, and you want a little bit of a behind the scenes. So, here's I mean, operationally, we have a great team in place. If you want to work with an amazing producer, work with Doug Foresta. He's awesome uh, and very very easy to work with. But here's the thing: is that for me, you know what? I ask you, like I, I send out a bit of a survey so I get an understanding of my guest in advance. I get that in advance. But I don't prepare a set of questions in advance. I go where my curiosity takes me. So I get good a good you. picture of what you're about, you know, and obviously I know you from before. But if it's someone I've never met before, someone brand new, someone I don't know very well, I get a general idea of their story. And that gives me a clue about where to go. But I don't prepare a million questions. I don't have it all scripted out. It's all a natural process because I just am plain old interested. And so, you know, what you get on the other end of the phone is someone who follows their interest. I remember I interviewed someone a while ago and she married a person who was in jail, actually, who was in prison. And I said, what is that like? And she said, well, it's exactly how you would imagine. And I said, I have never imagined something <laughs> like that. Right. So so how did you get married? Was he on one side of the, the, the fence or whatever, the window, the glass? And you were on the, the other? Like, how did that work? And I want details. I want to yeah, know. Yeah. How things yeah. work. She said, yes, that's exactly how it was. I was with a priest on one side of the glass and he was on the other. And I thought, man, what kind of experience yeah. was that, right? Like, and so what I want to know is I want those details that other people don't necessarily think to ask. That's why I don't prepare. I just yeah. go to the next place. But for me, it's podcasting actually interestingly is very natural and I, I don't know what number we're on uh, we we passed the 100th episode I think we're on 110 or 120 something like that and I, I kind of woke up one day going how did I get here it just happened yeah yeah I I, I think it's wonderful and I actually have been seriously considering doing it I uh I may, when the timing is right, do it because asking questions is very natural for me too. I would also be curious about the, the, the person married a person in prison. It's funny, I used that as an example in another podcast a couple of days ago about a, uh, a shipping company that specializes in um, shipping to people in prison. And, uh, and I talked about uh, coaches who specialize in people who fall in love with prisoners. So it's funny that we had that point of interaction in the same week. And I'll just say one last thing about you following your instinct uh, about interviewing people. I was on a podcast a few days ago where we did it very spontaneously. Like we were talking about doing it, but we hadn't set a date. So one morning I said, okay, today, like in a half an hour or whatever, in 10 minutes. And he said, okay, okay, but I just need to prepare some questions. I said, okay, okay, okay. And he seemed so shy um, even though this guy has had a TV show before, a radio show, but he really wanted to prepare, prepare, prepare. I finally said to him a few minutes before, I said, you know what, lose the pre- You got this, right? The second he got on the line, it was exactly like you. He was naturally interested, whatever. But before that, so you have the conference to go, confidence to go in there 
uh, I guess because you've done it so many times and you know that you're going to be fine. But he was still kind of nervous about going in there without a script. But the minute that the, the switch was on, he was on fire. Mm-hmm. So... Yeah, I don't know if it's confidence or if it's, I feel like if I'm too scripted, I'm not present and I really just want to be present. Yeah, exactly. Okay. I don't like questions ahead. Yeah, exactly. So thank you so much for being on this show with me. Thank you for sharing your expertise and your humor. And uh, I'm looking forward to that coffee date. It's time. Oh, for sure. For sure. We're going to do it. All right.